First, I want to say I know uh, Hank's not with us this morning, and he's at Drew's church, and they start revival this morning. So, certainly want to be in prayer for them, and um, want to wish him a, a quick trip back, right? Because y'all didn't come to see me; y'all came to see Hank. Just be honest. That being said, if you would take your Bibles and turn to uh, Matthew chapter seven, we're going to message this morning on hearers and doers. Hearers and doers. All of us can hear, all of us can do. The question is, can we do them at the same time? And God wants us to do both. So we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. Um, before I do, I'm going to put one person on the spot, and that's my son Jacob over here. Jacob, how you doing? <laughs> I want you to do me a favor, if you would. Would you just stand up and ask God to bless the reading of his word? Thank you. Man, thank you. And now, if all of you would stand for the reading of God's Word, if you're able. Matthew chapter 7, we're going to read four verses, 24 through 27. I'm sure you've heard this before. These are the words of Jesus in red. He says, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came. And the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house. And it fell and great was the fall of it. You may be seated. You know, <clears throat> Tyler came up to me this morning. Where's Tyler at? Is he hiding? Is he still? There you are. And he came up to me and he said, hey, brother, saw about your message and and he started telling me about these songs they just sang about the winds howling and the rains coming and he won't. <laughs> he won't fail. Isn't it great how God orchestrates stuff? And, you know, just little stuff. It don't take a lot. If, you, if you're looking for it, it don't take a whole lot to get blessed. God just gives you a little nugget, man. It just says, that's good. That's really good. So that being said... Let me ask you a question this morning. By the way, I like to ask questions, okay? I'm not saying that you have to answer aloud, but I like to ask questions. And so when I ask questions during the course of the message, all I'm asking a little bit is do a little bit of introspection a little bit, right? So where does this question apply to me, my situation, what I'm going through, my Christian walk, that sort of thing? So uh, we'll start off with some questions. We'll start off with a light question this morning. So my question to you is this, how many of you like... Let's say if you saw an old house somewhere and you said, hey, this house needs remodeling. How many of you would say, yeah, I'd like to tackle that. I'd love to remodel a house. Anybody? Oh, you want to have David do it for you? Okay, that's great. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. So, <laughs> Davis, he's already tapped out, man. He didn't even see the house yet. I'm tapped out, man. I got it. Let me ask you this. How many of you would say, I like watching shows where they remodel houses? Yeah, probably more people would raise their hand for that, right? Because we don't like to get our hands dirty. You know, I'm, I, I'm that guy. I'm that guy. I'm that guy that says when something breaks down, who can I call? Okay, I used to be the guy that said, hey man, surely there's a YouTube out there somewhere where I can figure it out on my own and muddle my way through it, right? I'm sure some of you guys have done that, some of you gals. But guess what? I'm just that guy that uh, I'd rather watch it being happened. I'd rather watch somebody redo their kitchen for a thousand dollars than me try to do it for ten thousand dollars right that's how it happens let me ask you this to be more specific how many of you ever tried to fix a crack in your wall you ever wake up one morning and all of a sudden you just you look up and there's a there's a crack up there a crack wasn't there yesterday or as far as i can remember there's a crack in the wall and so you know if you're you want to try to tackle that project that's not a huge project right that's not a huge project um, so you take, a, you know, you, maybe you sand her down around the area a little bit. You take some of that drywall mud or whatever it is. A, what do you call that scraper thing? A spackle or something? Hey, okay. putty knife. I know who I'm calling next time. So take that putty knife and you smear stuff on there and you just smooth it out real good. You take some sandpaper, sand it down, and you paint over it. Even I can do that, right? 
But let me ask you this, what happens if after you do that repair, and then about three or four weeks later, that crack shows up again? That's where I call the king. Like, Obviously, I don't know what I'm doing, so I need to have the professionals come over, right? I know Jay East, he's a painter, but he may not know how to fix cracks. I don't know that, but regardless. So I'm going to fix that crack, but all of a sudden, three or four weeks later, Ed, that crack comes back. Well, I just better do it better this time. Somebody in the early morning service says, use tape, use tape. I'm like, oh, okay. So let's say this time for the, y'all's benefit, I know what I'm talking about. I use some tape and I tape that sucker up, buddy knife, mud over top of it, sand it down, paint over it. Whew, I'm good, right? Except about three or four weeks later, crack comes back <laughs> with friends. I got cracks now, not one crack. I got multiple cracks now. So if you're in my shoes and if you're in my house, what do you think is going on? Something's going on with my foundation. Somehow, somehow or another, my foundation has shifted. What that means is, is that there's something underneath that's invisible that's causing something visible now to occur that's a problem, right? So I can blame Jay all I want to. Jay does a great job of painting, right? But the crack keeps coming back. Jay looks at me and said, brother, I can't help you, man. I said, well, you can't fix the crack. No, I can fix all the cracks you want, but your crack ain't my problem. You need to call, edit. How are y'all going to edit that, right? So <laughs> you laugh first. You laugh, or Travis did, one or the other. But what happens is, is I got to call somebody else now because I got a bigger problem, right? What's, the, what's my problem? The problem is my foundation. And you see, the problem that we have today is there's cracks all around us, okay? There's issues, there's imperfections all around us that need fixing. If you think about all those, all those imperfections around, they're in our culture, are they not? There's imperfections in our homes. There's imperfections in our lives. And here's the thing, we all make efforts to cover them. We do. You know, I think about the number of young people that are here this morning, right? And you're, and you're, and you're here under the sound of my voice and, and, you're, and, you're, and you're building something, right? I'm, I know I'm kind of jumping over my notes here a little bit, but just hear me out. But you're, 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 you're building something. And, and I assure you that if the foundation is not right, you're going to start to see cracks. And your first instinct is, is to just cover them up. Your, 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 your first instinct is to say, well, it ain't that bad. I'll just kind of cover them up here and I'll deal with the main issue later. Right? All of y'all that are married know that it don't quite work that way, right? You better figure them things out early on and set the right foundation. Because Jesus had specific words in mind for people that don't lay the right foundation. Something tells me we'll get to that. So here's my first question for you this morning, my sort of first introspective question before we really get to the point of the message. My first question for you is this, are you willing to do what it takes today to repair the shifting foundation upon which you are standing today? Are you willing today to do the repair, to do the hard work, to do the heavy lifting, to repair the foundation, the shifting foundation upon which you might be standing today? That's the question that God has for us. Because either that's a yes or no question. Either you're going to hear these words of mine and say, great job, preacher. You did, a, you did a nice job. Can't wait for Hank to come back. I like him better. But, uh, and and, and I'll, I'll see you next time. I've got three points for you this morning as it relates to foundations. You see, there's hearers and there's doers. There are three things that we'll go over. A simple three-point outline. There's the comparison of two men. I'll go ahead and give you all three now. There's the contrast of two men, and then there's the conclusion of two men. So let's start first with the comparison. In other words, there's two men that are, that are listed specifically in here. In verse 24, he says, Everyone then who, who, who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man. Okay, so that's, that's man number one. Look down in verse 26. He goes, And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man. That's man number two. But as we look at these two men, we see how they're different. We'll get to that here in a second, but let's see how they're alike. Because number one here is that both men shared the same purpose. Both men shared the same purpose. What was their purpose? To build a house. You know, if you think about it, we all sort of share the same purpose, do we not? If you're here and if you're part of any kind of family at all, you're building a life, you're building a house, you're building something, you have a purpose. You know, in the, the Bible has many uses for the word house, that in this case, it's like a house is, is there as to um, uh, exemplify the building of a life. We also see the word house used as a family. We see the, the house of David 
in the Old Testament. We see the word house used as a ministry or a church. We see, for example, in the Old Testament that the temple was the house of God. We see that the church in the New Testament is mentioned in many ways, uh, one of which is the church is the household of faith. This idea of building and houses and erecting a structure on behalf of God or with God's help or with God's guidance, in this case on God's foundation, is critical throughout God's Word. This word house is not by accident. It's a rich word that's used in Scripture. It's also used in, the, in, the, in a nation or a society. Israel was known as the house of Israel. When we think about our government, we've got the White House. We have the houses of Congress. So when we think about you know, the word house, it carries many different meanings, but all essentially meaning the same thing. There is something important that is built on a specific structure. And what we're going to obviously be talking about this morning is, is that if the foundation is not right, there's no need in even building the house. Or certainly a house is not going to stand. So there are these similarities. The other similarity, too, is that uh, both heard the same message. Jesus says, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them, right? That's verse 24. Then in verse 26, and everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them. So in other words, whether you, whether you did them or not, guess what? Both men in this case, the wise man and the foolish man, both heard the message. They both heard the preacher, the best preacher to have ever preached. I told the early morning crowd, I said, you know, this is kind of neat because all I'm doing is re-preaching a message that's already been preached. Many preachers have done it, right? That's the easy part, right? All I got to do is just repeat what he said. But think about it. They both heard the same message. Here's the third comparison. This is how they were alike. Both of them were facing the same storm. Both of them have the same purpose. Both of them heard the same message. Both of them faced the same storm. Well, what's a storm? Glad you asked. A storm is any adverse situation that's there to come against you. It's something that, that, that you're on a certain course, going in a certain direction, and a storm comes by, and it, and it interrupts all that. It stops all that. It hinders all that. That's what a storm is. So, well, can you be more specific? Well, let me ask you this. Are there any of you here this morning that are facing any storms? Is there anybody here this morning under the sound of this voice that's facing a storm? What's your storm? Is your storm financial? Is your storm physical? Is your storm medical? Medical? Is your storm marital? Is your storm emotional? Psychological? Fill in the blank. But here's the fact, and I don't mean to preach doom and gloom. I knew this was going to be the part where it got quiet. But, and you've heard many people before me say this, you're either in a storm, you're coming out of a storm, or you're getting ready to go in one. That's not doom and gloom, by the way, y'all. That's a guy that's been, on, been around this globe a few decades just telling you that's life. That's life. What was it uh, Doc Holliday said in the uh, movie Tombstone, all you guys? He's there on his deathbed talking to Wyatt Earp. He said, there's no normal life, Wyatt. There's just life. Ain't biblical, but it's true. But here's the deal. There's still, again, though, there's this idea in some of our minds that if I'm spiritual, if I'm doing all the stuff I'm supposed to do, you know, it's a math equation. One plus one equals two. Me doing what I'm supposed to do for God plus God equals no rain. It ain't biblical. How do I know that? Because I just read it. Because what it says here, it says that there's Two houses, they look the same, they appear the same. Something tells me some cracks are going to start to show and we're going to find out what they're built on. One speaker said, or one preacher said it best this way, he says, sometimes you hadn't seen it rain until you start following Jesus. Some of you might say that's true. 
But let's look from a comparison to a contrast between these two men. So what we see here is a contrast. So how are they different? Let me put it to you this way. Even though they had things in common, they were still very different. So let me, let me, again, let's go back to the comparison and we'll use it to springboard into the contrast. So first, a fool, a fool can have a purpose. A fool can hear the right message. A fool can experience a storm. Any fool can do that. A wise man can have a purpose. A wise man can hear the right message. A wise man can experience storms. So at its root, what we're talking about here, there's this idea of being wise and there's this idea of being foolish or a fool. So let's talk about the difference between the two. Well, what does a wise person do? A wise person, someone that exercises wisdom, that is their ability to apply spiritual truths to life's realities. So if you're going to be a wise Christian, if you're going to sort of want to live in spiritual wisdom, you're going to be able to take what God's sort of gifted you with, take what God has taught you, take all this experience, knowledge combined with God's word, and you're going to be able to apply that to some realities, some storms that happen in your life. That's a wise person. Now here's the foolish person. The foolish person, now here's the thing, being a fool has nothing to do with your education. Being a fool has nothing to do with how many degrees that you have. Being a fool has nothing to do with how many years you completed school. Being a fool has nothing to do with how many years experience you have on your job. Being a fool is this, it is the inability or refusal to apply spiritual truth to life's situations. Being a fool is saying, I'm confronted with a situation, I know what I should do, but I will not do it, I'm going to do this. Now, you don't know anybody like that in your life, do you? Much less you. That's what a fool is. So let's look at this even closer. So where did the distinction between the wise man and the foolish man, where did the distinction start to show up? Well, it's in the foundation. Jesus said again, I'll be repetitive. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them, there's some action, will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. There's a difference in foundation. There's a difference in the starting point. Where do you begin to build a structure? Where do you begin to build any structure? Well, you build it on the foundation. Let me prove to what I, that what I'm saying to you is true. Not only did Jesus say it, but Paul said it over in Ephesians. If you want to turn real quick to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, I'm going to read verses 19 and 20. Paul talks about this idea of being strangers and aliens, but then fellow citizens. He says this, he says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you're fellow citizens with the saints and members of the what? The household of God. There's that word house again. He says, you're members now of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. But he doesn't stop there. Great thing about Paul, if you love Paul, keep reading. Paul provides more context than anybody you'll ever need. You start, you, you, you read, you come to a stumbling block, keep reading. So what does he go on to say? He says, not only is it built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, he says, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being jointly, being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God, is the cornerstone upon which the household of God is built. This house, this house. In other words, he set the example. He set the example with his church. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I'm the one that you set that 90 degree angle by that you're going to build this thing off of. He goes, do it like I did it. And it starts with him. Jesus is first. If you want to build something, then good, build it. Just make sure that Jesus is first. No better way to model what you're trying to build. We'll be more specific in a second, but then to simply set Jesus as first. If you're a young man dating a young woman, guess what you ought to do? Jesus is first in your relationship. Guess what? If you're a young man getting ready to marry a young woman, guess who needs to be first in that engagement relationship? Jesus has got to be first. Why is that important? Because sooner or later, I'm going to step over here from being engaged to being married on June the 22nd. Is that right? Close enough. Anyway, so you're going to step over here to be married. And guess what? What you set forth as a foundation here is now going to come over, is now going to transfer and translate over here. 
And guess what? In I don't know how many years, there are going to be some little ones coming along, right? And so the foundation that you set back here, that then transferred over here, is now going to be transferred over here with some little kiddos. Well, thing I get a bounce on my knee. And then all of a sudden, the foundation that you started over here, it translated over here, that then transferred over here, is now going to be transferred to them little kiddos because them little kiddos are going to get big. And now they're going to now transfer all that foundation. They're going to translate now to somebody else, you see? And they're going to join with somebody else. And so the idea there is that we can become so frustrated with our culture. I mean, can we, can we not agree? Look, I don't want to watch the news. I don't want to see any news alerts pop up on, on my phone. I don't. Why? Because it's all bad news. Good news does not make news. Bad news makes news. Okay, let's be honest. But if we are frustrated with our culture, that's fine. You can be frustrated. You get on Facebook and you shout your lungs till you blue blue in the face. I honestly don't care because I don't do Facebook. I told the morning crowd, I don't do Facebook because everybody else does Facebook. That's why I don't do Facebook. Okay? Now, that being said, so what are you going to do about it? That's it. Everybody wants to whine about it. Nobody wants to do anything about it because the hard work comes in doing something about it. Because the hard work is, is that you as an individual have to decide that the winds are going to blow, the rains are going to come. I got to build a foundation for me. For me. Because now this foundation, right, can now be translated into this part, right, into this part of the work that I have, a foundation as it relates to a marriage. A marriage now is going to translate into the foundation of a family, and a family is going to translate into the foundation of a community, and a community is going to translate into the foundation of a culture. But we didn't do the work here. That's the problem. Now, I just preached my whole message, Kevin. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Your wife didn't nudge you about that one. So, if you have a foundation that shifts, where are you going to see it? Like we talked before as we started, you're going to see it in the structure of the house. That's where it's going to become visible. Let me ask you this. How many of y'all ever gone house shopping? Y'all ever shop for a house? They cheap. You can get a house on the cheap now, can't you? Yeah. Let me ask you this. How many of you went foundation shopping? No, you didn't. Some of you guys say, oh yeah, I checked the foundation. No, you didn't. You may have, you know, the, the mortgage company may have required a foundation inspection, but you didn't go do no foundation shopping. Here's what you did. I guarantee you, you walk in the house and you said, oh, it's got stainless steel appliances. Oh, it's got a skylight. It smells good. How do I know these things? Because I was in manufactured housing for a dozen years. And you know what was funny? We used to dress up all our display homes. You know what we used to do? We'd, we'd, have, these, we'd have these glamour baths. Y'all heard of glamour baths? That's where you got the big soaker tub over here and a big separate shower over here. And you know what we used to do? We used to set, like on the little counter right there by the, by the tub, we'd set a couple champagne glasses. And we'd set a champagne bottle and a little, I don't know, some little towel or something, you know? And, and ain't that nice? That's what y'all ladies dream about. Y'all glamour tub with your champagne glass, right? And the other thing we did, we'd always go first thing in there, we'd always spray the most gosh awful air freshener in them things, make them smell good when you walked in. And then we take that, you know, that carpet freshener, you sprinkle on your carpet before you vacuum it. We sprinkled all over the carpet. We never vacuum it because when you walked across it, guess what it did? It kicked up that smell. So it didn't smell like formaldehyde when you walk in, it smelled like a, like, like a house. And if we got really good, we set up a couple of these big modular homes and then we'd, we'd bake cookies and we'd put cookies in there and lay them out there. Now, I was always amazed and things sat there for a couple months and people still eat them. But anyway, that's, that's another story for another day. I can't speak for that. I'll never forget, we had this home that we called the uh, home theater home, right? And we, there was this big old bowl of popcorn we set right in the, in the den and we had a sign on it, do not eat. It was gone every time. <laughs> that stuff had sat there for a month or so and we come in, that bowl be empty. I'm like, I don't know who ate it, but I'm glad it wasn't glad it won't me. But that's what you go shopping for. You, go, you want to see that gas fireplace. You want, to, you want to see them solar panels, maybe, if you're into that. You're on that house, right? That's what you want to see. In other words, you want to see all the stuff that can be seen. I had a preacher say one time, he said, uh, he said, if all you can see is what can be seen, then you cannot see all there is to see. And see, the foundation, a lot of times, is not what's seen. What we see is the ramifications of not having a good foundation. I was telling the morning crowd, you know, last weekend, my family and I, we went to Williamsburg last weekend. It was kind of the end of spring break, and we just kind of went out of town for a weekend. That was good. And if I were to pull out my phone over here, and I were to show you the pictures from that, you'd see people smiling. Y'all do that on Facebook too, don't you? You put out all them good pictures, talk about how great your life is, right? Uh, yeah, you do. 
What you, what I, you know, it's funny, sweetheart, we didn't take any pictures of the kids when they were fighting and grumbling and moaning and complaining. Why didn't we do that? I guess we were just a little forgetful. We don't want people to see. We don't want people to see the bad stuff, do we? We don't want people to see the cracks in the walls in our lives. We don't want people to see the dirt that we've swept under the rug. We don't want people to see a stack of laundry this high that's behind the laundry room door or tucked under our bed or somewhere. We don't want to see that. What we want them to see. We want them to see everything wonderful. There's problems with that. Because if we do that and we ignore the root problem of what's causing that, guess what? Jesus has a promise for that. And it ain't good. He goes on to say something like the the rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew, beat against that house, and it fell. He says, and great was the fall of it. Again, Kevin, that's the end of the message, man. Glad you came. So, what's the difference between sand and a rock? What's the difference between sand and a rock as it relates to a foundation? Well, here's some, here's some quick, easy definitions for you. Sand is easy. Sand is quick. Sand is cheap. Sand doesn't take any effort to do. By contrast, rock. Rock is hard. Rock is time-consuming. Rock is expensive. Rock takes some effort on your part. We're talking short-term versus long-term building. We're talking uh, structures here that are meant to, to last for a short time versus those that are meant to last for a long time. You see, the difference was where they started. I'm going to give you an example. David, out in my backyard, I have a fire pit. You know, one day, a few years ago, I thought it'd be neat. I, was, I, was, I went, went to Lowe's and I said, you know what? I want a fire pit today. I woke up this morning, didn't, not thinking about a fire pit. I go to Lowe's, I'm like, I want a fire pit. That would be cool. Surely there's a good video on YouTube that'll show me how to build a fire pit. So I did like any good man, and I pulled up a video, and man, how easy that was. So I went to Lowe's, and I bought the, the landscape block, and I bought some lava rocks, some pea gravel, some sand. I got two strapping boys that can help me build the thing, and I got my, what was it, a three, four-foot level, whatever we got, right? So I go over there, and I, I lay this thing out. We start digging around a little bit for a firm foundation, and uh, you can see where this is going. And so I, I get my sand, and I, you know, we, we pack it down as good as we can, I guess, at the time. And <clears throat> we build that thing up about three blocks high. And like I said, it's about four foot or so wide. Presto! I got a sand pit. I mean a sand pit. A fire pit. Neat little trivia fact. Right now, I got a tulip growing up right through the middle of my fire pit. <laughs> it's beautiful. I don't know why it's there. We're still trying to figure that out, right? Nobody really knows how the tulip got in the... Do we? Okay. There's a tulip. It's kind of reddish-orange, something like that. Anyway, it's, it's cool. It's going to get burnt. <laughs> but let me tell you, if I were to take you to my backyard right now and I were to show you my fire pit, guess what you would see? That sucker, boy, looks like the waves of the ocean all the way around. That sucker ain't level. got gaps in it. If you tap it with the lawnmower, it just, you know. I was joking with the morning crowd. I said, I've been over to the Vanderhyde's house over there, and they, they got a, man, they, they got a fire pit. They ain't got a fire pit. They got a fire pit. That sucker about yay tall, a bit out of cinder block. I mean, it's, I mean, you got to put a bonfire in that sucker to fill it up. I mean, it's huge. I didn't do that. So guess what I got? I got this little guy, right? Which is cool for me, right? Because if, if, I, if I do bump it with the lawnmower, you know, and it, part of it, if I just put it back up again, and I mean, it's good. I'm just using it to roast some marshmallows in, you know? It ain't that big a deal. Here's the problem. You see, most of us in our lives, we want, we want it big, man. We want it right. We want it grandiose. We want people to be able to look at what we got and say, yeah, man, Travis, look at him, man. That dude's got it together. I mean, look at all that stuff he posts on Facebook. I told you I was picking on Jay. Now I'm picking on you. You asked for it. I didn't, I'm sorry. I'm just giving you what you wanted. All right? So 
Look at me, man. Look at me, man. Look at my family. Look at my house. Look at what I got, right? Here's the problem. Most of us want these mansion-sized lives on a fire pit foundation. We hadn't put the time and the effort into making a difference on what it is that we're trying to build. There are marriages this morning. And again, this, this is kind of where I get specific, y'all, because here's the thing. I think the message is good, but if we're not careful, the message will be too generalized, right? The message kind of goes out across the masses. And then you can sort of, you know, cafeteria style. You can kind of pick what, what, what kind of works for me and what, what kind of doesn't, and I just nibble this, and, but I'm going to leave that alone, right? So again, it's, it's specific because Jesus said, he goes that everyone, he didn't say some people, he says, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them is wise. Everyone that hears these words of mine and doesn't do them, they're foolish. Everyone, that's you. So when we start talking about these things, think about I'm building a life, you're building a life, right? That life, no matter whether it started 10 minutes ago or 80 years ago, guess what? You're still building. God still has a reason and a purpose for you. So please pay heed. Please pay attention. You're not, nobody is discounted in this message. Nobody gets by on a technicality. There are young people today that want to build marriages, mansion-sized marriages on a fire pit foundation. There are people that have been married for decades still trying to build a marriage, mansion-sized marriage, on a fire pit foundation. And I'm going to tell you why that's dangerous. Because on the surface you can say, "Uh uh-huh, that's right, yeah, uh uh-huh, what he said. But that's dangerous. You see, I'm okay with my fire pit being like this, okay? I'm not okay with my family being like this. I'm okay with my fire pit with some little gaps in it and it's not quite level and if I knock something down, I can put it back up. That's all me. That's all me. The problem is in a life, when my, when, when, when my personal walk with God is not built on the right foundation, when my marriage is not built on the right foundation, when, my, when how I uh, uh, choose to act and react as a father is not built on the right foundation, there's other people that are going to pay, not just me. I got to be responsible. You got to be responsible. God has placed responsibility in our lap. We don't get to to go through this life willy-nilly. Guess what? We live for Him. We live live for the living God. He's worth going through all that for. You see, I'm not okay with these things crumbling from the inside out just because I won't take time to build them on the foundation of Jesus Christ. It takes effort. So here's what people typically do. Where's my time? Man, come on. Last, look. Okay, I'll do my best. So what people try to do is this. They they try to mix it up a little, okay? So rather than doing it God's way specifically, they'll try to mix it up a little. And here's what happens. So they'll say, okay, um, I like the security of the rock, okay? I like this, but I like the simplicity of the sand, So here's my next question for you. This is deep, y'all. This is deep theological page coming right at you. Who likes broccoli? That's great. So does Melissa, by the way. Look, Melissa, I'm going to tell you, you have been so participative this morning. You get an A. David, buy her lunch or something nice. Okay? So think about this for a second. For those of you that don't, don't like broccoli, what does typically mama have to do in order to make broccoli more appetizing? Yeah, I know y'all say cheese. My family's laughing because I hate cheese, okay? Yeah, you put cheese on it, right? Or you, you douse it with butter or something like that. What happens when you do that, right? Basically, you know, uh, unless you're a keto guy, then you can eat all the cheese you want. It doesn't matter. But here, but basically what you do is you nullify all the nutritional value that you really get from the broccoli by dousing it with something else that ain't healthy. By the way, that's called a southern menu, okay? <laughs> y'all take your green beans. I say y'all, we, right? We take our green beans and make a casserole out of it. Take your broccoli and make a casserole out of it. Take something make a casserole. It's still a vegetable, right? When it turns into a casserole, somehow it's still a vegetable. Fine. So it's macaroni and cheese, I heard. So, but yeah, we do. So, but here's the thing. People do this all the time with God's Word, too. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll hear a word being preached, right? And they'll say, yep, yep, I agree with that. That's all good, Right? But then they walk out the door and they got to sprinkle it right with a little bit of worldly wisdom in order for it to make sense or fit into their life. In other words, 
Rather than you having to fit into God's mold and into God's word, you have to now make God's word fit into you. And that's a dangerous precedent to be in. Wouldn't you agree? So, and as I mentioned before, and I almost got ahead of myself, this is where it gets dangerous. Because when we do that, we now walk out of church, we now walk out of, into this world, or even worse yet, into our homes. Stuff happens. The rains come down. The floodwaters start to rise. The winds start to blow. And something critical happens. All of a sudden now we think, well, God's word's not enough. God's word is not powerful enough, or God himself's not powerful enough for my situation. When in fact, we sprinkle cheese on top of it to make it more palatable for us, and we are not willing to do the diligence and the hard work that we are responsible for in our Christian walk in order to set the right foundation so that when the storms come, I stand. You see? We'll get there closer in just a minute. So what was the fundamental difference in the two foundations. So here's my thing. It wasn't what they heard, right? Both heard the same message, but here's the difference, right? Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man. I know I've read that over and over and over. There's so much meat in that one phrase, that one sentence, that one half a verse. He says, here's the deal. Only one person acted on it. You see, the word doesn't become alive and it most importantly doesn't become alive in you until you act on it. You say, well, the Word of God is powerful no matter what. Look, that's fine, but you're treading on dangerous ground. How do I know that? Many people will foolishly sit through a church message, through a Sunday school, through whatever in, uh, as it relates to church. They'll listen to a sermon. They'll leave the church. They'll go out into this world. They'll ignore everything that was preached. And then they feel that the word and that God has no power. So think about it this way. Uh, Abraham in the Old Testament. What did God tell Abraham to do? He said, I'm going to make a great nation of you. He said, but I need you to do one thing. What did he say? I want you to go to a land that you know not of. And what did Abraham do? He went. There was God's word. But then there was the action on God's word. He acted so that's not enough. Great, I've got, a, I've got number two. How did God save Noah and his family? God gave a specific instruction. God said, he said, build a boat. He said, don't just build any boat. I want you to build it so high, so wide, so long, da, 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 all these kind of things. So many cubits this way and that way. And guess what? He built exactly what God said. And what did God do as a result of how he acted? God did what he promised. Noah was, think about it this way. Noah was able to withstand the storm. Some of this is metaphorical, y'all, but some of this, but it's a literal story, but it applies to you and me, okay? You say, well, gee, that, that's not enough. This thing, I'm going to tell you, either my ear is slippery or this thing is just terrible. Either that wire's going to bend or I'm going to bend my ear. How about that? How did God rescue the Israelites from slavery in Egypt? Well, guess what? God uh, appears in a burning bush to a man named Moses. He says, go set my people free. And after some encouragement, guess what Moses did? He went. So in the case of Abraham, in the case of Noah, in the case of Moses, guess what happens? God says, move, and people moved. We say, well, that's still not enough. Great. All right, well, let me tell you about one more. There's the armies of Israel. They're sitting there across the field there from the armies of the Philistines. And God speaks to the heart of a young boy. As he walks up and he sees he's there to bring food to his brothers and, and, he, and he speaks to this young boy and this young boy looks across the field. He sees this, this giant and he says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he would defy the armies of the living God? See, God was alive, right? So much alive that he says, oh yeah, you won't do anything about it. I'm going to do something about it, right? How many of us are going to be so tired of nobody doing something about it that now I will do something about it? Right? In this case, we have, the, we have the instance, the example of a young boy who says, I'm going to do something about it. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to take a rock and I'm going to place it squarely in the forehead of a giant because he didn't see a giant. He saw an uncircumcised Philistine. He saw someone who didn't have the promises of God. He had the promises of God, the people of God, the nation of God. And guess what? He acted on it. We've got all those things, y'all. We don't act on it. If you want the Word of God to come alive in your life, not just on a page, not just in a church building, then as soon as you walk out that door, you've got to act on what God specifically is asking you to do. 
And here's the thing. You may not know what he wants you to do 100 feet down the road, but here's what you can know. I will guarantee you he will illuminate one step for you and take the one step. You don't got to slay a giant on your, on your first attempt. Okay, just take a step. What does that mean? Again, I'm picking on husbands this morning. By the way, we've got a men's ministry that's going to start on April the 27th, Saturday. All men are invited. We're going to have a sign-up sheet, and I want you to sign up. Be our, be our first sort of real kickoff of a men's ministry here in the church. I want you to be a part of it if you're, if you're a man. Okay? But here's the deal. We've got to act on it. Men, I, I love to pick on men. We've got to act on it spiritually in and of ourselves. We've got to act on it in our households. We have to act on it in our relationships with our wives. Man, you know who the standard of beauty is in your house, in your life? Your wife is the standard of beauty. There ought to be no other beauty that your eyes behold other than your wife. You ought to love her, cherish her, live for her, sacrifice for her, like Jesus sacrificed himself for his church and died for it. She is precious. So, Today, the world is full of people that can come to you and they can quote Bible verses. They do. But here's the thing. They have no history of experiencing the mighty power of God by walking in obedience to Him. Think about that. Quote all the Bible verses you want. That's fine. But if they never follow you out that door, it don't mean a hill of beans. So, you're quoting scripture that you do not experience. You're walking, excuse me, rather than walking by faith, you're talking by faith. Instead of knowing him, you know about him. That's not a foundation. It's not a foundation. How do I know? Because here's the conclusion, point three. <clears throat> it didn't become apparent who was wise or who was a fool until something really critical happened. What was that one thing? It was a storm. It's not apparent who's the wise man and who's the fool until the storm comes. Let me put it more intimately. It's going to become evident with you where your foundation is when the storm hits. You see, all things looked equal until that point. The houses are built. Man, they got the same shingles, the same siding, the same windows, doors, appliances, glamour baths, solar panels, skylights, da-da-da-da-da, shrubbery. But then the storm hits and things are revealed. <laughs> so, what does the storm look like? Well, Jesus tells us. He says the rains fell. We're not talking about a sprinkle. He says, in fact, the rains fell so hard, he says, that the waters began to rise. That's a flood. And he says, not only did the rains fall, not only did the uh, flood waters start to rise, but then the, the wind blew, right? He says, the wind blew and beat against that house. Beat against. Y'all catch some of them winds we had this week? Did it beat your house? I feel sorry for some of y'all that got metal roofs, man. All that, just a rumble, 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 all that kind of stuff. It's cute when the rain's kind of trickling on it. But man, when the winds come, those steel roofs, those metal roofs can be tough. But it says that the, that the rains fell, the waters rose. It said the wind beat against the house. In other words, this is a hurricane, y'all. This is not just a sprinkle, right? A house built on an on a easy foundation of sand, right, can withstand a sprinkle or two. What Jesus said is that your house, when the rain hits, when this, when it, in other words, when your, when your world falls apart, it's going to reveal what the foundation is built on. And not only will it reveal what the foundation is and what your house is built on, he gives a, he gives a stern warning as to exactly what will happen. He says it's going to fall. And he says, not only is it going to fall, he says, great's going to be the destruction of it. Look, my admonition to you this morning is, is that if you know, if you know something's not right, if you know something's not right, for the sake of all that's good, spiritual, and holy, do something about it. 
do something about it. If something's not right in your heart, if something's not right in your walk with God, something's not right in your family, something's not right in your relationships, something's not right, do something. God's command is to do something. See, if we do something, then he then will then show himself and manifest himself in what we do. But I've also got a bit of a warning for you. You can't change a foundation in the midst of a storm. You cannot change a foundation in the midst of a storm. Why? Because it's a storm. You see, a lot of us, this is what, we're, this is what we try to be good at doing. We, 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 we try not to do all the heavy lifting, the hard work of building a foundation. And, and I, I like it into you know, building a, uh, putting together a big puzzle. Right? You, know, you ever put together those 500 or 1,000 piece puzzles, you know, and you put all that stuff together, right? And when it's done, I always wonder, when you're done with the puzzle, what do you do with it? Right? What do you do with it? Well, let's just say at that point, you're like, well, I guess I'll build another puzzle. So what do you do? You, you take all the pieces and you just kind of whoop, and you pull all together and they all break apart, you're right? And you're just kind of like, man, I went and did all that for nothing. It, but in our lives, what we do is, is we try to put something together. It falls all apart, right? And then we come to God with all the broken pieces and says, God, if you will, put all that back together again. I know it's my fault. I know I messed it all up. But God, I just need you to fix it for me. That, that's not a spiritual recipe for success. Now, it's good that if you do tear something up, you do mess. It's good that you come to God, Right? But for the purpose of the message this morning, what I'm trying to explain to you this morning is that God has a prescription because knowing that, there's a, that, that either you're a wise person or you're a fool, okay, you know, the, you know the storm's coming, it's coming, right? And what he's saying is, is that God commands us to build upon the right foundation before the storm. Why does he do that? He does that so that we can withstand the storm. You know, there's a, a song they sang. Tyler, I'm still, man, I still ain't over that. Those songs y'all sung? Man. But there's this idea, again, that if I'm walking a certain way, I shouldn't have to experience storms. You know, God wants to walk like that song. I'm sorry, I got sidetracked. What God was saying through that song that you were singing this morning was that he's walking with us through that storm. It's not just a matter of us building a foundation and just magically stuff starts to happen. No, God himself walks with us through that storm when we build the right foundation. So here's something I want to share with you. Over in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 12. Y'all have heard of the whole armor of God. I'm going to draw a... Um, a correlation here. I'm going to draw a connection here between the whole armor of God and this foundation we've been talking about, and then I'm going to finish, I promise. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, Paul says, Finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand, stand against the schemes of the devil. The schemes of the devil are storms, okay? The schemes of the devil are storms. He says the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities. These are all storms, y'all. Against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Therefore, he says there are storms, there are storms, there are storms. He says therefore. He says therefore, do what? Take up. The whole armor of God. Take up the whole armor of God that you may able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm, stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and so on and so on. In other words, we build a foundation, we put the armor on, the entire armor, so that we will stand. Just like we build a foundation prior to the structure being built, we put our... Let me ask you this. How many of you would show up in battle and put your armor on in the midst of the battle. Ain't gonna happen. You're just trying to survive. If you've been through a storm, you know what I'm saying. If you're in the midst of a storm and the foundation not there, let me put it to you this, put it to you this way. You ain't thinking about God. You're thinking about how am I gonna get through this? How is my, my determination? People I know, whatever, whatever. How am I gonna get through this? How am I gonna survive? You ain't thinking about God. But he's thinking about you. Here's the thing. 
that breastplate of righteousness, that helmet, that the, 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 the sword and the, and the shield and the loins girt about with truth all the way down to the feet. They're done specifically for a specific purpose. What's the purpose? This is your life I'm talking about. What's the purpose in which God says, I want the right foundations. I want the right armor. I want it for this purpose and this purpose mainly. It's so that you will stand. Because whether you're in a storm, whether you're in a battle, it's the same thing. What he's saying is, is that you need the ability to stand. And I'm telling you exactly how you're going to stand, how you're going to make it through it. I'm giving you everything that you need. And we stand there and we're like, well, hey, but, but look at that house over there. Look how beautiful it is out there by the ocean. Look at how beautiful. Those folks got it all together. And Jesus says, all it takes is that one storm to come and it comes crashing down. You see, that storm may come in your life. And just to use the imagery a little bit more, look, you may suffer a lost shingle or two and it may rust a window open and all that. That's not the point. It's not to say that the storm won't come and the storm won't be bad and this stuff, bad stuff won't happen. That is not the point. The point of it is, is that no matter what the storm is, you will stand. Here's the thing you got to realize is that, and, and tell yourself is that when I do things God's way, I'm going to stand. Some of us look at it like, well, I hope I do. I hope all this Bible stuff's right. I hope God is who he says he is because that's where I put my faith and trust. That's not faith and trust at all. The bottom line of it is that you do it God's way. God will do what he says he will do. You will stand. Man, God's good. So I'm going to leave you with this. I'm seven minutes earlier than I was last time. I wish I could tell you that you would face no storms with God. But what I also want to tell you is that if you've built a life on a rock, not only hearing, but doing, God will help you stand. And he's there for you. Will he leave you? He won't. Will he forsake you? He won't. Can you build a life on him, with him, and through him? You better. Here's my last thing for you, and I'll, I'll dismiss or shut it down. You can't build a foundation on him, with him, unless you know him. <laughs> so you can leave out of here thinking, boy, that dude, man, I like what he said. I like what he said. I'm inspired but you don't know him. <clears throat> there was a religious man that came to visit Jesus at night in John chapter 3. His name's Nicodemus. He comes to the door and he says, you know what, Jesus? He said, we know that you're a man from God because no no, nobody else could do these things that you do, could do these wonderful, marvelous works that, that, that you do. And Jesus says, well, thank you for the compliment. You know, I've been working hard to get noticed. He didn't say that. He cut right to the chase. He said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. <laughs> he said, if you want to talk about the things I do, he said, first, you need to know me. He says, once you know me, he said, then we can talk about the things I do. And then I can do some things through you. That's what he's saying. His promises of a house built on a rock ain't for you if you don't know him. Here's the good news. He can be known. The good news of the gospel message is, is that the God of the universe and the Savior of your soul can be known intimately. And I got some even better news for you. He already knows who you are. He knows where you're at right now. He knows your foundation and where it's at right now. He knows what you tried to build on your own. He knows where you fail. He knows where you tried as far as the, 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 the biggest part. And you can as determined as you could be to, to do everything as good as you possibly can. And that's great, but it ain't enough. And he just says, you know what? It's time for some foundation building this morning. And this morning can be step number one. Set the right 90 degree angle. There we go. Cornerstone. With Jesus Christ being right there.